Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036359, 0703 768119. Email address lsmedia at or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Babakunde Ogogile is joining us in from Lagos. He is uh, a certified uh, courier. Uh, he, is, uh, he has his master's, a BSc and master's in uh, geoinformatics. And uh, he's currently rounded up his PhD also in geoinformatics. Uh, but Babakunde joins us from Lagos. You're welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Also joining me in the house is again Deborah Mensa. Deborah Mensa joins us uh, from Russia. Deborah Mensa has done a BSc and MSc and is currently concluding a PhD also in Russia. Deborah, you're welcome. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I, I would uh, be handing over to them to quickly introduce our guests today. Uh, over to you, Bokunde. All right. So today we are privileged to have our panelists with us. We have our guests, and one of them would be Bishop Dr. and Dr. Mrs. Ben Kwachi. They are a couple, and Reverend Dr. Benjamin Aga Kwachi was born in Plateau State into a Christian family. Reverend Kwachi first followed a military career but felt the call of God over his life in 1976 and resigned to follow the Lord. He was ordained an Anglican priest in 1982 and proceeded to serve in several rural and urban parishes. He also became the rector of a theological college. He was consecrated as the first bishop of the newly created Anglican Diocese of Jos in 1992. Reverend Kwachi obtained a Doctor of Ministry degree from Trinity Episcopal School of Ministry in 2002. In 2008, he was ordained an Archbishop of Jos Province in the Church of Nigeria and was re-elected in 2013. He has been a leading name in the Anglican realignment, appointed the General Secretary of GAFCON, a Bible-based global Anglican movement which submits to the authority of the scripture. He was awarded the Doctor of D Divinity degree honoris causa from N Nakota House Theological Seminary in 2004. In 2003, the Federal Republic of Nigeria conferred on him the national honor as an officer of the Order of the Niger. He authored Evangelism and Mission in 2018 and Neither Bomb Nor Bullet in 2019 as co-author. Bishop Kwashi recently retired as Bishop of the Anglican Diocese of Jaws. Bishop Kwashi and Dr. Mrs. Gloria Kwashi married in 1983 and they have six children. He and his wife Gloria served in both rural and urban churches before moving to Jos in 1993 where they currently live. Gloria has a passion for orphans and vulnerable children and a couple and the couple have over 70 orphans living with them in their homes. 
to run the Zambi Zambiri Outreach and Child Care Center in a primary and secondary school. Bishop Kwasi and Dr. Mrs. Gloria are joining us from Dor, Nigeria. You're welcome, Bishop and Mrs. Kwasi. Thank you. <laughs> Over to you, Brother Cindy. You're very much welcome. And I also want to welcome everyone. Um, another person we have today as our guest is our brother, Musiba Lassisi, who was born into a large Muslim family and was the seventh of 23 children. His discipleship journey began in 2001, just before he gained admission into the University of Lagos in 2002, where he graduated with a bachelor of science in mechanical engineering in 2008. He's a technology entrepreneur who is passionate about digital transformation using the technology platform to push God's kingdom agenda in the marketplace. He has over 17 years of experience in technology consulting, IT governance, agile project management, and enterprise architecture, working in the finance, financial service, information technology, and management consulting. He has led and delivered complex and high-value IT projects for government and private sector, implementing information system processes, aligned to enterprise strategy, improving customer experience, and driving continuous IT transformation initiatives. He has also obtained multiple professional certifications, which include project management professional, Toga Enterprise, Architecture, Business Analysis, sub tep 10 and 10 plus ISO certification. Mosbao currently runs a group of five businesses in technology com compliance and management certification. He's a committed, he's sorry, he's committed to student and youth missions and outreaches in secondary schools in particular. And he's very passionate about teenagers. He is happily married to Sister Shayo and they are blessed with children. Mosba is joining us from Lagos, Nigeria. You're welcome, Brother Mosba. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. All right. So our next guest is Brother Samuel Adebisi. Uncle Samuel Adebisi, fondly known as Baba Adebisi, was born in Ondo State. He was born into a royal family, but lost all his eight siblings due to power struggles. He is the only survivor of his mother, and he lost his father when he was three days old. Due to financial restraints, he could only attend primary school. In 1973, he started learning carpentry and began earning some income, making small stools for sale. Baba Adebisi learned the vocation for six years, majored in furniture, roofing of houses, and big lorry buses. His interest and passion for the vocation were triggered by the need to make ends meet and support his poor mother. His employer, who taught him carpentry, also led him to Christ in 1975 and took him to Bible study classes, which he enjoyed. One day when he was praying, he saw a clear vision. God had taken him to Boko, where he had never been before. So he moved to Boko Benue State in 1979, a few years after giving his life to Christ. Miraculously, he got linked to Mr. Shitu in Boko, who sheltered him and introduced him to Peace House. Baba Adebisi got married in 1981. He and his wife were blessed with four children, are blessed with four children, who are all married with their own children. Two of his children reside in Canada with their families, while the other two reside in Nigeria and are into business. Mr. Samuel is a certified carpenter and is currently the chairman of the Carpenter Association in Boko, where he resides and joins us from today. You're welcome, Mr. Samuel. Well, I'm grateful you're welcome to. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much. We want to again welcome all our panelists 
And just to mention again to every one of us out there, you're free to send in your question through the menti.com and the code is as displayed. Please do ask your questions as you so wish. Um, by the grace of God this evening, our first question will be going to our Lord Bishop, uh, your grace, sir. Uh, from your bows, we observe that you were in the military when you received the call of God on your life. And uh, we just wanted to know, how was it? That was how were you able to take that decision? How easy was it to follow God's call? Uh, was it a difficult decision? Or was it just something you did without uh, any, you didn't feel anything about it? Thank you very much. Um, it was not an easy decision. Hmm. Um, it was at a time in a season of Nigeria where there were more opportunities than you could have thought of. I'm talking about 1974, in the 70s, mid 70s up to 80s. And coming from military school, we were already trained to serve the Nigerian army. And so by our brain and mentality, the opportunities were narrowed to leadership in the Nigerian army. And there were few number of qualified people who could become officers, warrant officers, sergeants, and all of those opportunities in the Nigerian army. And the war had just ended. So the opportunity came to me to make a choice between taking either a short service commission or finding an opportunity to go to polytechnic and university, which the army will sponsor. I had just become a Christian, 1976. And I was asking God only one question. Lord, what would you choose for me? And one scripture came to me. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. That revolutionized my life. And so I walked to my immediate boss and told him, I'm leaving. He asked why? But I tried to explain as a young boy, as a 20 year old, he couldn't understand. I said, the Lord is asking me to seek his rule, his kingdom. And I didn't understand the meaning of those verses at all at that time. All I knew was I was seeking. And he asked my chaplain to talk with me. My chaplain spoke with me. He couldn't convince me otherwise. They took me to my commanding officer. They could not convince me otherwise. I felt it was time for me to leave. So I put up my discharge papers. And just as I was putting my discharge papers, a new chaplain came who recommended me to the Bishop of Northern Nigeria at that time. And in front of me, I could see the rural ministries in Northern Nigeria. And I felt excited whenever I thought of rural ministry. Very, very excited. That was my joy. And I saw them as poor people, people who needed help. But being trained as a soldier, I knew what to do in any rural committee, community. I could dig a well, I could build a house. And being an infantry, there were many things you could do that we did as young soldiers. So that was the beginning of my call. And indeed, God tested me. My bishop sent me from Kaduna to Yola. And that was how I started my ministry in Numan. Sorry, sir. You said God tested you. Practically, what were those tests like? What, what were the challenges that you had to face and how did you come through them? The first test was financial. Hmm. 
the soldiers in those days were not uh, poor at all, at all. We had all kinds of allowances that beefed up our salaries, our income, to as a private soldier to almost 200, 200 and something naira. In those days? My, in those days. My income as a catechist now was 50 naira. And I was even more qualified because the catechists who were my mates, four of them, they're still alive. No, sorry, one has died. They're still alive. They had one child or the other had two children. And that month, my salary was increased to 60 and they had 50 and they had children and I was single. And I said, Lord, if you can feed these people with children with 50 naira, you can feed me with 60. The second testing was when I arrived in the station in Numan. The elder looked at me and he said, sorry, we don't need a catechist anymore. And I didn't know why. It was much later when now, after I had walked and I was being sent to school, that he told me why. Because I arrived with my guitar, with my haversack and my sleeping bag on top of it. And I had with me my jeans and t-shirt and canvas. Now, that in those days was a clear sign of Begiska. This is uh, <laughs> you, you are not a conventional priest. <laughs> no, this is not a catechist. But the man who <laughs> knew me, my archdeacon in Yola, Venerable Obian, knew me in Jaws and knew my story and knew the story of my conversion. And he was the one who told the bishop, send this boy to me. So for two weeks, they would not allow me into the church until my archdeacon came and said that um, he asked me to come in and they should allow me. But within those two weeks, I was playing my guitar outside the church and children would gather and I was leading them to Christ with tracks, with music and dancing outside the church in St. Peter's church. This story is true. You can ask anybody who, was, who knows this story. So the women of the church Children would go back home and they would tell the story. So the women of the church fought the elders of the church. They said, we want this catechist in our church because their children were being led to the Lord. And that was the test that I had to go through. The last test, of course, was there was no house. So I slept outside my first night. Of course, I had my sleeping bag, I had my guitar, and I had my, I would just play at night, eat bread, sardine, and so on. Under the open heaven. Yes, yes. The, the tree where I slept under, my children know it because whenever I travel to Newman, uh, my wife knows it. She's from Newman. They all know the place and I show them. I say, this was where my first night was. <laughs> so the bishop then, the Lutheran bishop, Akila Todi, who knows my bishop? And I went to plead with him about a place. He gave me a youth center, one room in youth center. It was next to the graveyard. So, uh, and, and the owls and the birds of night, bats were, the trees of the forest of grave was there. So I said, Lord, this is a serious matter now. My very first night, I, I, I didn't sleep. And coming from Lagos, born again with Holy Spirit, I prayed tongues, I cast it, I bound. And by the first night, the thing was so vicious because now I was hearing the scream. I said, Lord, if I will die here, I've not even saved souls. This is my life now. So I now removed my shirt and angrily opened the door to face the demons, only to find out that it was pigs, actually, that they were screaming more. I mean, I didn't tell this story to my wife earlier until much later. But those were the little tests that a young 22-year-old boy had to face to start ministry. At, at, at 22? Yes. <laughs> and you were not discouraged to, to just pack up and start going back? No, no, not at all. In no. fact, when my archdeacon came and the church opened, and now finally the elders, they told me I couldn't preach for more than five minutes. So I agreed. So I preached. I didn't preach for more than five minutes. But many things I decided then as a young catechist to speak to them nicely and gently to stop. And they didn't like it but they couldn't fight me because I was always smiling and nice and humble. Anything they said, I say, yes, sir. 
but I was getting along and the women were supporting me and the children were supporting me. Uh, some of them used to bring beer to the vicarage to drink. I said, no, this one, please don't. And it was so nicely that by three months, the church grew by about 5%. So the story began to spread around town that there's one young uh, Anglican. They, they didn't even know the difference between Katkis and, uh, and Pastor because I was wearing white castle. I didn't have many clothes. So only white castle all over. So they thought I was a reverend father also. So all over the village, they just knew me and the Lutheran church accepted me. Um, the brethren at that time, young brethren, Philip Mukunga, uh, Paul Tyre, all those young boys now, young men at that time now, who are now bishops all over Adama, we all were together at that time. I attended AFCS conferences, FCS meetings. In fact, FCS meetings held in the youth center next to my room. So that was big encouragement for me as we moved quite, on. Quite, quite a testimony. Let me hand over to Brotunde. Maybe he has a question next before we move on. To all right, I sure do. I sure do. Um, Paul in Second Corinthians, sir, your grace, sir, um, say, for we are alive uh, and we are always given over to death uh, for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Uh, we saw also that you could a book titled Bullet, neither bullet nor bomb, or not, neither bomb nor bullet. And then um, I just wanted to know, I mean, what inspired such a book? Was it the beginning of this kind of experience where did was it these demons you started talking about or were there some other experiences that uh, uh triggered the writing of such a book sir would like to know well um before i got married i served in Numan, i served in vorm and then i got ordained and posted to zaria and then we got married with gloria in 1983 and um when I got married, it was a boost to me, a huge boost to me, because by this time, seek first the kingdom of God has become the theme of my life. There's not a church I have been that I've not preached that sermon as my first sermon and the last sermon. In Just Diocese, I've preached it 31 times before I retired. It was my last sermon at retirement. There was such a glue in my heart and mind that this was what I was looking for. It so satisfied my soul, my spirit, my body, that this is what I was looking for. So I'm not looking for anything. I wasn't even looking for what Nigeria would offer me or even what the church would give to me. I was looking for the kingdom of God. This seeking is still glued in my spirit. So in the context of seeking the kingdom of God, I did not know that there would be a clash. I thought when you are seeking the kingdom of God, people will applaud you. But I did not know that it was a drawn war between the world and the seeker of the ruler of God. Because the rulership of God. Because you want to institute truth in the church. You want to institute righteousness. You want to institute justice. And this was not acceptable. And it's worse in the time by 82 because it was military regime. And, and my wife and I were so interested and keen about opening health care for the poor in the rural areas. We would leave Zaria, and we used to have assistance from our church members who are professors in the university, teaching hospital and university campus. Many of them would support us. We opened up villages around Ikara area, and they would come with us. And we were doing all of these things, starting you know, little communities of pure Hausa Christians who are being converted. Late Beatrice Ghani would go and teach there. Late Professor Isha Audu would go there to help me with medicines. Um, Mrs. Um, Professor Ekrem Poo. Many of these people followed us and we had huge support from Graduate Fellowship in Zaria. And we were doing this to help and bring people to Jesus, to bring the reign of Jesus over lives. Then boom we had the first burning of churches and I was the Young Christian Association's chairman in 1987. Between 10th to 12th of March, over a hundred churches were burnt down, actually about 140 something, and several yeah. Christian homes and several Christian property destroyed. Mm -hmm. And one thing happened. 
as a Christian chairman, I just said to the Christians, stand still and see the salvation of God. Believe me, the first miracle I will ever see was this. The Christians obeyed a 29, 30-year-old boy who was just the chairman of Khan. Nobody did anything, and they watched their properties destroyed. Hmm. Now, after that, we thought that was the end. My life was threatened in Gimi Dabosa. I barely escaped with my life. So I asked the question, Lord, what is all this now? What is all this? So to cut the long story short, that particular incident in Zaria, the only response I got from God was silence. So I told Gloria, and, and I thought I was going to die, actually. I'd written, I thought they were going to kill me. So when we finally presented to Justice Donnelly panel, I didn't even tell her I was going to present. I just told her I'm going out, you know, because we were protected by soldiers and everybody. So I told her I'm going out. I'll soon come back. It was at the gate of Congo Conference uh, um, Conference Center. As I was coming out, I saw Gloria. I said, what brings you here? Because by this time, the whole place was in uproar. The senior brethren in graduate fellowship were carrying me shoulder high for the presentation I made, but they didn't know the decision I made. Because God was silent, I say, okay, now God, I'm going to be recalcitrant about the gospel. I'm going to preach this gospel and I'm going to do it urgently. And I'm going to speak all my heart of what I know of the Bible, whether I know how to interpret it or not. If they kill me, fine. If they leave me, trouble. So whichever way the devil wants, I'm ready. <laughs> and that didn't end there. It followed up, up to Zonkwa. It followed up to Jaws several times. So people who know this story, have told it all over the world. And Andrew Boyd, who has visited Jaws, Maiduguri everywhere many times, he knows Northern Nigeria and the persecution of Christians, he works with release, decided he's going to write this story. That's how that book came about. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. What a story. I think, uh, uh, Deborah, you have a question? Yes, I do. But my question would go to Mama Gloria, I see how Lord Bishop talked about your experiences together. But before we get into the ministerial aspect, I would like to ask from you know the very onset, was it a very difficult decision for you, Mama Gloria, to marry Bishop Kwashi, <laughs> who was in full-time ministry? Were there any fears you had at all? Can you please tell us? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was not such a difficult decision for me. Um, we met in the seminary in TCNN, and um, I would say I already have been taught what to look for in a man and um, to look for <laughs> to look for a Christian and um, I was so pleased to attend the previous um, program before now um, where they were talking about discipleship and discipler and the disciple. And I just resonated with that a lot because we had people who had gone through uh, choosing partners who helped us in fellowship. And when I came, I knew what, what to look for in a man and not to look for uh, any physical anything. Physical may be good, mm -hmm. but the most important thing is somebody who fears the Lord, somebody who is... Um, willing to go uh, for missions and ministry. And I I think that he, he just uh, was such a man. And so to, to I didn't say yes, but, say, mm -hmm. but to, to listen to him was not a difficult thing for me to do. Many other people came, some young men came from the seminary, but I think that he, uh, he superseded them. Yeah. So I was, I, it was not difficult 
Do you know? Okay. That's interesting. And it's not because he, he was handsome. He's still looking handsome, even at uh, <laughs> at this age. <laughs> <laughs> He's not bad. He was not yeah. bad, and he's still not bad. <laughs> if I may ask a follow-up question, Ma, uh, also in line with what uh, that that book, you know, I'm just wondering. Fine, at the beginning, uh, you're able to marry him. Can you? What through all those uh, death threats? What was it like? Can you even share? one example and how how it came to you how god helped you through it share one example of such situations where it was between life and death um the the one he spoke about uh i will say will be the first to me in zaria um in fact when that happened when the churches were attacked and our house was burnt, everything. He um, barely escaped. Uh, the, the security, I think, came and took him. I was not around and had traveled. So when I was at home, the story had started, you know, to go around that somebody was uh, the chairman of Khan in Zaria was killed, that he's a young man. Uh, they described him, they described the, you know, my husband, and that as he was standing and preaching that the Muslims started throwing, you know how people tell stories, that they stoned him, he fell from the pulpit, and then they stabbed him, all sorts of things. I was pouring my milk to give uh, my child, because I had a child that was um, six, months. six months old. So I was pouring his milk. And then I noticed that I was not really attentive because I was listening to what the women who came back from the women's fellowship were sharing where I was. So I just picked my things and told my sister I was going back to Zaria. So I, that was the Zaria I couldn't get back to. They stopped me in Joss. So well, when I went, God had already, well, I kept praying and many people were praying, but they didn't know it was my husband they were talking about. And I didn't tell any one of them that that story was about my husband. So when I came, his sisters kept me in just, I kept praying, but the Lord ministered to me. Um, in fact, when I went to our house and I saw the bond place and everything, I, I was not, I, I, the Lord gave me peace. Let me put it that way. He gave me peace. But with this word that heaven and earth will pass away, but it is only the word of the Lord that will remain forever. Mm. And that encouraged me. Amen. But the one that I now face by myself, because I would say because of my marriage to my husband, was the one that um, happened in Joss when uh, some people were, called, were sent to assassinate him. And I was the one that was met at home. And um, they did all sorts of things. But again, I remember calling on to Jesus. I, in desperation, I said, Jesus, save me. I didn't know also that I would be alive. Mm. And Jesus helped me. Mm. I, you know, when people say that, they saw a structure. They th I've gone through many things on account of, um, you know, um, our marriage, if, if I may say. Mm. But I saw that I, I, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm. When the people, when the attackers, when they, they noticed he was not around, they told me, you want to kill yourself because of this man? Tell us where, we, where he is and all of this. It's a long story. And I told them the truth, he was not around. He would have come back. He had called to say he was coming back. But then the Lord just made it that he couldn't come back. And that was the night that the attackers came. So I called on the Lord and I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
as mm. if I was to just take a deep breath. And I did. And then my life was changed. I was given mm. extra, extraordinary strength to mm. walk on foot from our house to the office because they insisted I must take them to the office. They believed if he was not at home, he will be in the office with bleeding, everything, and I was able to come to the office where I now, you know, pass out. And I didn't know the rest of the story. But we have we have seen quite a number of threats, not once, the second, uh, the second year again, after the first year, the people came back again, and so on and so forth. It's been... It's been wonderful, I will say. Thank you when so much, Ma. Say, yeah. Thank I, you so much, Ma. I know that we can't finish all the stories here, but I'm, I'm sure people are hearing and listening that through all this, you are standing strong. You didn't turn your back on the task that God has given you. You didn't run away, and the Lord kept you. We are, at least that's how we are seeing you today, because the Lord has kept you. Let me hand over to Deborah. She might have a question for Bob Musiba. Yes, I definitely do. But even before I get there, I see the practical example of, uh, you know, having a relationship with God and having, you know, the Holy Spirit. How the Holy Spirit gave Bama Gloria peace, even in, in times of these storms and hardships and all these hard experiences. There's an emphasis of what the message we listened to this afternoon knowing God for ourselves. Now, Brother Mutiba, I would like to ask this question. We saw from your profile that you were born into a Muslim family. We would like to know, how did the transition into Christianity happen? Can you tell us a, a brief story about that? Okay, thank you very much. Um... Hmm. Just briefly, uh -huh. I know I yeah. know it's going to be a long story. <laughs> I know I'll I'll okay. cut it brief. I, I'll start by saying I was actually I am actually a product of my salvation experience is a product of the FCS mission because I also gave my life to Christ in secondary school through um, the FCS missions in Niger State where my school was as Fulija. And, uh, but years before then, when I was in primary school, there was a missionary that was posted to my boarding house in Zaria. I was based in Wusasa, Zaria. I was attending St. Bartholomew School beside St. Francis of Assisi, just beside Vina Rock. Yeah, I used to go through Gawan's house and to, through the rock to those places. So there was a missionary that God sent to my boarding house. And she labored for about two years. After she finished, she was always focusing on my life. And once she finishes, she will leave everybody and ask me, so are you born again? Are you ready to give your life to Christ? The answer was always no, because I was never going to tell her that I was saved or even understood. And I think after that woman left, another pastor was sent to that school. Then God gave the wife of this other pastor the vision to also continue that same labor. That was another two years experience again. Now, um, to cut the long story short, I got into secondary school. I thought the battle was over, you know. For me, I was a Muslim. I used to go to Jumat with tracts because I used to argue a lot with Christians. That I will, once I'm in Jumat, I have tracts, I have word of faith, word of grace, if you know those pamphlets that they used to release in those days with Gideon's International Bible. I used to collect those books, while, while I, the, those blue Gideon Bibles while I was in school with those tracts. But for, on, on one occasion, I encountered the Lord. and That was in secondary school. And it was a no going back experience. And since then, it's been wonderful. Of course, I went back home with joy to tell my dad that I had met Jesus. The man started crying. He cried, you know, he wept. I couldn't understand why he was crying. So as he was crying, I joined him in the cry. 
So we were both crying. You know, mm -hmm. I was the seventh child of 23 children, and I was his favorite child. So for him, because I was always first in class, so he always liked the brilliant child, you know, parents do that. So I was sadly not always first position in class and all. So he liked that. The man cried. We both cried. They told me, go and think about it. You know, so I said, I'll think about it. Of course, the Lord confronted me that I must declare him even before my people. So I went back to him and told him, no, I wasn't going to change my mind. That I found the Lord, giving my life to Christ. Then the battle started. Yes, mm -hmm. it was not a small battle. Yes, I was sent out of the house. I was this. Wow. You were this sent group. literally out? Yes, I was. They packed all my things. I have a twin. I have a twin brother. So they separated us. Yeah, they didn't even consider whether I was a twin or not. Because the, there were the, when the imams came, they had two decisions, two options. It's either we kill him or ah. you send him or you disown him. So there were, those were the two options. But because my dad was also Baba Adini, you can't keep Baba Adini's son. You know, no matter how strong you are as, a, as an imam. So they had to tell him that they think he should throw the second option. He should disown him. That when he suffers, that have how much suffering, you come back. So I was thrown into the streets in Kaduna back then. I strolled on the streets, on the road, until I found my way in the military barracks. And somebody accommodated me. While I was in the barracks, I was invited for a program at Holy Convocation 2000 at Chapel, um, I can't remember the church. That was Brother Aframi Rikano. Bragbile was the one that preached at that Holy Convocation. I ran out for the other call. Of course, I couldn't keep in touch with him. And until the next year, I saw, found myself in University of Ibadan through another relative who heard about my story. And that one decided that, okay, he's a doctor in the University of Ibadan. He said, maybe I didn't have enough good Islamic upbringing that I should sign a one-year contract. So we signed a one-year contract on paper. The contract stated, that I'm going to train you to write your job and get admission to university for the next one year. I also school you, reschool you in Islam. If after one year you don't change, I will leave you. And I'm the, and he was the last hope of any support from my family towards my education. So we signed that one year contract, February to February, February 2001 to February 2002. The contract expired, of course. And uh, at the end of one year, he called me. He said, your contract has expired. And we can see that you even got stronger and stronger within this one year period. So you just have to leave my house as well. So that was you were, you were attending fellowship in UI or you were attending programs in UI. What happened? Well, I was attending a fellowship in UI. And a brother in the fellowship invited me to the chapel of the resurrection for another meeting that Bragbile was preaching. And after he ministered, I went out again for altar call. And I went for counseling. And the counseling was, because the persecution was fierce. You know, you know prop, I mean, Bishop, our Lord Bishop has told us a lot. The persecution from the Muslim home is not just physical. It is also spiritual. Absolutely. There were a lot of spiritual sacrifices that were done. At some, there was a time I was taken to Babalao. And the Babala who went inside, he did all he could do. He came out, he said, Mo pashe fwe, money ko yi pada. He said, Baba, ko she she, ko she she. He tried again. He tried again. He came back. He said, Mo pashe fwe. I said, Baba, ko she she, she she. So he said incantations and said you must change. He said I must change. And the Baba said, you are not changing. I said it's not possible. And Baba the only thing must have made you strong indeed. No, he gave a testimony. He told my family, he said, this boy, he belongs to the secret court. Yes, that's the secret court. Yes, that secret court. They have a power. And that power is the one that is carrying that power for them. That he can see <laughs> that power inside him. And he said, there is nothing anybody can do to change that boy's mind because he's the one carrying. <laughs> Power of the power. The one. So that was my that was the testimony of the Babala one. Since that time, they started leaving me alone. You know, they just you know, I just I just wish our young people are hearing this. There is a power you carry when you are in Christ Jesus. The yes, world sir. cannot yes, stand against it. 
That is a power. There's a power. The power of the Holy Ghost is real. Is real. People are experiencing it, and you can experience it also if you choose mm. to follow Jesus. Thank you very much for that. For that. For that. Let me. Let me. Let me allow our moderators to go ahead. I don't know whether it's opportunity that I also ask him the next question. You also have about DBC's next question. Thank you so much for that testimony. All right. I actually want to ask um, Baba DBC the next question. And um, Baba, we just looking at your biography, a very difficult, so to say, family background. How did you come to this encounter with the Lord Jesus? And what were the significant change that occur uh, that you can say uh, this was who I used to be? And when I experienced Jesus, this is my experience. Thank you very much. Uh, it's God. It's the... uh, to me, I just find it like that. It's God's grace. You know, after... I was a Jehovah witness to say the fact. I'm very mm -hmm. deep witness. And you know, they have poor many, many, uh, many lessons, many doctrine into my into my, into my head. And uh, by the time I left home in 1973 to a war, uh, I used to follow my master, the carpenter. Uh, to, to the church, to evening places. That's crucial union. I don't have otherwise because I was living with him. I know by going there, from my inner man, I was not happy to fellowship because where I'm coming from, you are with this. How will I shape? Who knows Bible more than you are with this? That was my thought. And we just get and sat at the last, and I will take off and slept. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. But you see, the few minutes before I slept, I will be hearing some words from the teacher or from the preacher. And I'll take it that this one, the and that is, I went to, because they've already instructed us to pray, which pray. And not Jehovah when they just say pray, long prayer, and I just short one. So and I, the Lord gave me grace to pray to ask, what will I do with this teaching? And that is how it came to my mind that you have got to wish you needed to give your life to Jesus. Mm. And that's how I opened my heart. In the course of listening to the word of God is crucial union of those days. From there, we left to new life for all nations, disciple of Christ. I know that teaching also so powerful. Hmm. That is how we continue. And in that is that's where I choose to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Hmm. I wish to tell you people that uh, if the youth can have air to they let them see, from the youth day, you need to submit to the law. When you look, because by then I, there's no helper. Remember, mm -hmm. I I lost my father in three days old, and my mother, is a poor woman, and I didn't go to school. I stopped from my sis in 1969. And that is what I have today. By God's grace, that I'm okay with that. But I want to tell you, in this fellowship, that about seven brethren, young brother, youth, we pray for the church. We pray for the church. Sing God. God, why am I here? You know, I've already left Jehovah's Witness now. Pray mm -hmm. with them. Before church, before the church we sat those days, we were already there. Mm -hmm. We have night vision. Ourselves. Mm. Go on. And as, and as as young people. Yes. Mm. That's mm. what I'm telling you that the youth, the youth must listen. I'm not mm. here for you. You are being university. But I'm telling you that I didn't go to university, but today I can share with you that 
Being giving your, I'm not saying university is bad, but be giving your life to Jesus as a youth. We pray. God kept coming down to me. And I was, I'm looking at you. I will be seeing, I will, God will be telling, just talk to you in just four minutes. I will know what you are thinking. I'm so surprised. The Lord just said, I thinking. Look at this brother teaching. Before even the teaching, before fellowship, I already know what they are going to teach that day. And the Lord exposed things to me. And I want to listen. It can happen to you again that you can submit to the Lord. And by God's grace, that is what that is why from there I became a strong Christian. Amen. Thank you, That's sir. To ask a follow-up question to that, you became a strong Christian. Yeah. So now there, there's something about artisans generally. Uh, this matter of um, you know, there's a general belief within the artisan system that um, you need to be able to cut corners to really make it. You know, how can you tell us what was your experience and how did God help you with that? Ah, now you, you are accomplished. You have gone far. Uh, you've traveled. You you you've gone very far in yes. this and you you become such an established person. So were there corner cutting or how did God help you? Maybe, yes, maybe so then, a present level or what? By then, before the Lord exposed me to people, I'm, I was already, I'm already in Bogo, in Benue State. Which I will cut it short to tell you. The, oh my God. The direction what we're talking about as a youth now, in that very praying I told war, the Lord told me, go to which I never know. Who is in Bobo? I don't know. How will I go to Bobo in 1979? How? And I told the brethren that I pray together that God say I should go to Bobo. Where is Bobo? Nobody knows. But when the Lord, I will see a knife of mercy, this mercy trowel. I will, I will see it, I saw it myself on the and I don't sleep on that very mountain. In the night, I will see myself climb on the mountain and uh, see myself holding the, held the, the, the straw wear. And I will come down in, I will, I will come down in that very dream and started building, building church, building church. And I'll say, it's okay. Huh. The second time, the third time, the third time then, I or what? carry my load. And I came to Nisha, I'm looking for Boku. And go down to the garage. Why? Because the young man that I was, the young boy that I was that time, was kindled by God, by his grace. Then, when I now continue to ask for Boku, Boku, I, I, people, I told the people in the garage that I'm going to, I said, you see Boku, no? Remember, 1979, I told you now. I said, I don't know, but what I heard from dream is, Boko. They say, look at this young man. He want to lose you. He said, he saw it in the dream. And that is how one man came out and said, you say you are going where I said Boko. He said, Boko? Who oh, that is Boko? Now, that is the first place I know that uh, uh, bike for taxi. Now, sit on the very bike. He will, and he told the young man to take me to that place. By the time I went there, that very place, I was here, Boko, Boko, Boko. Oh, my heart said, that is where you are going to. And I want to tell you, that's how they took me to Boko, shot me. And when I got to Boko, what I did, I ran to, to, to sign board. I saw Boko being with it. I said, this way the Lord have assigned me. That is how I came to Boko. Starting about what we are talking about now. Starting, then immediately I came, oh my God. If you want to, please. <laughs> <laughs> the time I gave it down, by the time, I carried my, my, my bag. I was going. If you are in Boko, you know all Christian fellow. Boko Center Church. But I was just going with my bag. Then the Spirit said, at the BC, are you are going like a madman. Ask somebody. Ask somebody. I said, what will I ask now? The Lord was just, was just talking to me. Just because of the fire of the youth which has came to my heart. Now, I now say, okay, let me ask him. Because that place was a bush. And I'm branch, I say, Make Please, do you know any Yoruba a pastor that can take me? I'm a visitor here. He said, No, I don't know any Yoruba I'm a, a, a pastor. You, you, and the, the owner 
544 white those days in 1979. Now say, young man, why are you disturbing my this already? He sees that I want to go. Come, come, come. And if when I turn from the mechanic to talk to this man, the owner of the between that very, very short step, the Lord said, ask him, she too. Uh -uh. Ask of that man, she too. And that is how I turn to him. I'm a, I'm a visitor here. I don't know where to sleep. Do you know anybody called she too? He now say, uh -uh. are you looking for she too? I say, yes. Stay from where? I say, from a war. And I want to tell you, it's the Holy Spirit because the, before I met the young man, that very just and tricking of our eyes. The Lord told me, Do you remember that for what that day? And say he's living in Otuko, he's a believer. He used to go to Makwadi as a transporter, as a transporter. He used to go to Lafia. And I slept, I even came to Boko, I slept with Shitu. Say, ask this man, Shitu. That's how I remember many years ago. And I asked the, the, the man that, do you know Shitu? He said, that is where I'm fellowshipping. New anointing ministry. <laughs> to take you there. If you are the one, what will you say? <laughs> that is how I say yes. And that's thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. This is a serious experience. So, so, so mm -hmm. now there was just one point I wanted to draw out. Yeah. As an artisan now, so of course you have given us the background. We see that clearly you were led by God. Yes. So uh, the, does that imply that all the regular changing of figures that artisans do, inflating of uh, things and all that, it was 10,000 kilometers away from you. Sorry. That's the question you asked before, but I was carried away. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I you just, just give me to say a that. yes, no answer. <laughs> I just want to analyze those areas that youth, we know that God is in control. Now, yeah. about changing of figure, uh, when the Lord spoke to me and said, I want to introduce you, and uh, I'm going to get work from here and there, all the big men, government, they were just calling me, and there's some people, they will just bring money and give to me, million, and I never heard million, I never heard million before, and the Lord helped me, I never changed figure. I was open. You were, get, you were getting the million inside Boko. Yes! Yes, especially, I want to tell you, million, even if you want me to mention the name of those people, I will mention, million, they will <laughs> <laughs> When they look for me, they will say, I will uh, take it, I will come back, I will record everything, and I give it to them. They were so, the only, when, now, now make me to see that, the Lord now uh, introduced me to many people, especially, mm. especially, uh, some people who went say, that at the BC is a Yoruba man. The Lord bless him with wisdom and he can walk. He doesn't change figure, he's a mm. foolish man. He doesn't, he doesn't charge. Give your work to, to him. And that's how he's a foolish man. Give your work to him. <laughs> yes, he don't know, don't know anything about money. He doesn't know how to cheat somebody. <laughs> yes. Amen. But, but in the long run, in the long run, that means it made you to have more jobs. Yes. And do better. Have bigger More jobs. Customers. And yes. hand your good pay, your honest yes. pay, very well. Praise yes. the name of the Lord. Even the, the, the Igbos, that's the only the people that challenge me. They will come to me and say, Adebisi, this pole line or this two by four we are giving to you, we are selling it at rate of 500 naira. It's just because of you, it's 600. I say, that money, the thing I bought, write it there. And they were not happy. But the Lord will bring you jobs. And the, later, heal me and they agree with me. Amen. Mm. Let, me, let me allow um, uh, us to go quickly back to the Lord Bishop. Our time is, uh, is running. Let yes. me quickly go back. Yes. So just before we go to Lord Bishop, one of the things, key things I'm learning from Baba Adebisi's story is how God is able to lead you, guide you, and make you, despite your family background, despite your educational background. It's one mm -hmm. key thing I'm learning. Once your life is surrendered to him, he's able to make you. Amen. 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 So, to Lord Bishop, 
please, as a minister, in what specific way has your marriage enlarged and prospered your ministry and God's calling on your life? Now, I ask, I'm asking this because there's a section of your story that tells how one time you, or there were instances where you had enough to buy some flashy stuff, but your wife would not allow and <laughs> she would surprise you with bringing some people and all. Oh, I would like you to emphasize that as you ask this question. It's going to bless us as young people. Honestly, I think that my father loved my wife. Um, my mother did and, and my younger sisters did. They did. I didn't know why they loved her, but... I was to discover later on that thriftiness is a, is a good thing for every Christian to exercise and how to save money and how to use money. But my wife is extremely thrifty. So when you have an extremely thrifty person, it's, it's, it's funny. So in any case, I learned how to serve and I save and how to invest and, and make sure that our monies are properly used for the kingdom purposes because I'm a kingdom seeker. However, there is some other aspect of me that was still there. I mean, I was thinking in my life, having served that by the time I'm 70, which will be next year, I would be riding a sports car because I wanted to be able to go to places quickly um, you know, and, and and then do my ministry and then come back. And I didn't want much, you know, it's a two seater. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it so, and I specifically wanted a, a Mercedes because I've always driven a Mercedes. I like Mercedes. It's a reliable car. It does what it wants. So I was preaching in Germany. So I went and I saw the sports car that I wanted. And I, I saved them. I was I was looking at it. I drove it actually from Stuttgart to from Berlin to, to, to Stuttgart. Smart car, you know, fast and everything. Two seater, 350 CLK compressor. So, <laughs> so when I came back from Germany, unfortunately for me, I saw some 16 or so little children and um <laughs> I said, Gloria, who, who, who are, did you get these children from? She said, they are our children. I said, our what? She said, I don't know. With whose permission? She said, she, eight of them even have HIV and AIDS. I said, in my house, AIDS. How can you do that? And our last child was just six years old. How could you do? We can't survive it. I, I'm not allowed. She wouldn't listen. She followed me upstairs and said, Ben, all I want is money for blankets and mattresses. Because by now, they were littered all over the living room. And, you know, they were little children, so naturally. They pee on the bed. The, when we come for prayers, the smell of, the, oh, God. So I said, no, look, let's build something around the house. That was the first mistake I made. When we built so a small... Our money went. We bought, uh, <laughs> we built this block and for boys, for young girls, and then... By the time I traveled again, I came back, they were now 32. <laughs> <laughs> so my sports car became, the money was depleting. <laughs> and then before I would know it, she had started this school with over 300 at that time. All of them vulnerable children and half orphans and full orphans. She would feed them every day up till today. And she would pay for their exams, uniforms, so my sports car became, it's just gone. I've forgotten about it. now. If you see what I'm driving now, you'll feel sorry for me. It's, it's, it's a junk, it's a junk Suzuki put together. I mean, it's outside there. That's what I drove here with. So, I'm, I'm just a miserable case about that. But let me tell you, I am so thankful to the Lord that that little greed in my heart that was hidden, which nobody knows, that that feeling of fulfillment in a car, which nobody knew, but she knew, I told her, God has delivered me mm -hmm. using her. Mm -hmm. So I'm now not enthusiastic about any car anymore. I ride bicycles since I retired, I've been riding bicycles. It's only because of the rainy season 
that I brought back this my junk car, which I put it together. It's about 28 years old. It's so noisy. The Land Rover is the tires are Land Rover steering is Land Rover. The engine is that soon. By my training in the army, I put it together. If it's raining, you have to enter, you have to enter with your raincoat in the car because that's how it is, but it moves. So I'm okay. <laughs> No, no, but this is this is interesting. Uh, the priorities, I, I pray God keeps helping us with correct priorities for eternity. I will allow bro today to quickly move out to bro Musibao so that we can begin to wrap up. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Your Grace. Sir. We're very grateful how that the Lord, for me, I'm just seeing how focus is properly directed. And God is using your home to help you to sharpen that. Uh, I trust the Lord that he will continually strengthen you in the name of Jesus. Our brother Musba would like to just, just ask... A minute, just a minute, Tunde. Can I just yes. add that because of her, we have graduates now of the children mm. who are here. Mm. Some of them are teaching in the school and quite a number of them in colleges of education and tertiary institutions and mm. all of that because of this testimony. So, it, and, and they're committed Christians. I mean, some of them have even gone into ministry right now. And are graduates yeah. even of theology. Mm. So, I, I, and you know, the point, is, the point is some of them may have become more of the robbers, the armed robbers, the mm. assassins, the kidnappers, because mm. they will have had nothing to do. Mm. They will have had nothing to do. I probably have they would have been part of people hunting this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but this must be very fulfilling. <laughs> really bless the name of the Lord. Um, I brought a musical. Can you tell us, we'd like to know, what impact has discipleship had on the trajectory of your life? Uh, from that boy who, by the grace of God, met the Lord, and then to university, and now we're hearing of different things the Lord is doing with you. What role did discipleship play in all of this? Wow, discipleship very played brief. everything. Very brief. Oh, very brief. Now that's okay. Uh, very brief. I'll use timeline to answer briefly. Timeline 2000 only convocation, 2001 UI experience with Bragbile, right there. I went for counseling. Bragbele handed me over to Brother Jari Adedibu. He said, go and meet that man. Whatsoever he tells you to do, do it. So I went to meet Brother Jari. Brother Jari told me, come to Peace House of his Samonda. I went to Peace House of his Samonda. When I was there with him, he looked at me. He said, look at that man. Brother Rufus Murakio. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Me, I will be around. I'll be traveling. Second hand over. So I continued with Brother Rufus. Then my admission came out, University of Lagos. Ah, then Barifo said, you have to go to Lagos. Okay, there is one brother in Lagos. His name is Moses Ogianyo. I'm directing you to that brother. Go and locate him. So that was how I was had transferred, transferred, transferred until I got to Lagos. So I got to Lagos and I met brother Moses and sister Anne Ogianyo. I used to go to their house. I was going there. We we're going to discipleship classes, doing everything. And fortunately, we were invited for Student Congress 2004. I was at that first Student Congress. And the first message, Battle for the Young, was preached. They've edited that message now. If it was the first the video, to watch that first video, you'll see me among the people that ran out. And Ragbile came to lay hands on us. I was wearing a shirt similar to this color. If you have that video, I was in that first author, first message, live and direct, 2004 Student Congress. That's 20 years today. And um, while we were coming to Goku, while we were in the bus, because I was praying for a disciple, there was a young brother who was leading the team. And the Lord told me in the bus that day that that is your disciple. So I told the brother beside me, God has told me who my disciple will be. Is that brother that is leading us to Goku? And that happened to brother Tokwe Adeni. And it's been more than 20 years. I mean, it's been 20 years now. And everything has been, discipleship has been everything. I've carried him along on every decision, marriage, career, work, everything. You will observe that I studied mechanical engineering, but I'm in technology today. It's discipleship. You know, you know that he's also an IT person. So 
So it's the, <laughs> she, it does her night pregnancy. So it's discipleship. And I can't say more than that, but I'll just add one. And then what took me to technology was because I was a problem solver. And if you know him very well, he's also a problem solver. And mm -hmm. uh, I used to solve problems around and ICT problems. Maybe people have virus in their computers, they call me, I go and sit down with the system, I'll look for the virus, fish it out. So discipleship all the way, career decisions, marriage decisions, work decisions, everywhere I've worked until I came into business, it was all discipleship. There's just so much, you know, but because of time. Let, let, me, ask, let me ask for just an instance. Now, have there been points where um, um, you were nudged to go in a direction in discipleship but maybe you felt you go the other way or you delayed or something. Were there points where you oh, yeah. it, according to the timeline that I spoke about, that was in 2010, after my NYC. I was um I started a business. The business was running well and fairly, you know, I was traveling everywhere. But at the end of the year, I'll come and give account to my disciple and show him the business, how it had. You see, look at inflow can be maybe an example. One particular year, inflow was 12 million. Outflow was about 13 million. So meaning it was negative. So we wait for the next year again. I'll work, we'll do everything, run through the calculations. Outflow was more than inflow, meaning I was running into debt. He said, no, no, this is not how to run the business. You don't yet have the capacity to run a business. I was saying, no, 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 no. So he didn't struggle with me. He allowed me to continue until some friends came around and said, I like this, your business. I want to invest in it. I said, wow, you like my, you're doing well. We can see you have office, you have this. And immediately they dropped money. I lost the major contract that I had that time. Immediately they, and I started paying 10% monthly interest. I was still paying interest and the principal was still intact. One day they brought policemen to come and arrest me. My friend, they were my friends. Because of their money, I ran to my disciples' house and I was breathing like a goat. He said, hey, 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 what happened? I said, hey, this is what happened. He said, hey, I thought I told you that you should go and you should get a job. Let's get a job. Are you ready? I said, yes, I'm ready to get a job. And we sat down. It was just a simple prayer. His wife and himself in the Apollo, we just prayed. And within two weeks, one of the banks that I had pitched as a, as a company, was looking through my mail and they looked at my professional qualifications. The HOD was just looking through, saw all those qualifications. And the month earlier, the central bank had sent them a regulation to restructure and employ certain set of individuals. Now he needed three people, but the skill set for those three people, I had those three skill sets. I had the international accreditations for those roles. And they called me. I thought they called me for vendor registration so that I could do a project for them. And the man said, no, this is not a vendor. This is interview. You are the one that I want. Just tell me how much you want. And HR will give you the money. My, how I entered banking was a miraculous one because of that prayer that my disciple and his wife prayed. I was given what I asked for. You named your price. I named my price. So, and I was paid what I would have earned with 15, 20 years post-graduation experience. I got that five years post-graduation. I took that offer letter home. I went to show my disciples wife. My disciple was not yet back. She could not believe it. She looked at it, said, what? She says, that prayer, that's what it has produced. It's what it has mm -hmm. produced. And it was, and my career continued to grow. From there, it was always double promotion because one of that scripture is that, you must also be faithful at what in that which is another's. Because God must prove us. Every word of God must be proven in our lives. And mm -hmm. all through the time, and my disciple told me then, you are going into this corporate world to learn organizational capability. And I'll say mm -hmm. one other thing that he also told, I learned later is that I also learned how not to do business. Because the principles of business in the world system is different from principles of business in the kingdom. They are totally different things. Even managing clients, managing staff, employees is totally different from the principles of the kingdom. And so for me, all through 
I carried my disciple along. There is no decision, even hiring decisions. Sometimes you have to check. You say, oh, Lord, are you sure you can hire this person? Okay, let's check it. So sometimes I wait. And even though I need somebody so urgently, I have to wait until confirmation has come. You know, so all true. And I can tell you the result. One result is that consistently for the past four years now, whatever we make in a year as a revenue becomes what we get in the lowest quarter of the next year. Mm. So I'll just give an example. Let's say a whole year, we had 20 million. The next quarter, first quarter of the next year, the least quarter will be 20 million. Meaning by the next year, we'll be making 80 million. So that 80 million we made in that second year, in that second year, will be the least in the next year that follows. Mm. So that kind of multiplication is geometric. And mm. that has been our testimony. Mm. And yes. the Lord has been expanding us. And this is just because of discipleship. And mm. it's not only my disciple, you know, because my disciple is also, he has a lot of elders around him. And from time to time, I also meet some of these elders and I get counsel, I pull and draw, you know, and he's a very open person. So um, I think I should stop there. Okay. Right? So just, <laughs> just, in the line, just in the line of discipleship, I would like to read one question from menti.com. Okay, great. Okay. The person says, to Brother Misibel, now that God is using you for his work, is there anyone in your family who is following now? Hmm. Hmm. Goodness. Can we spotlight that question? <laughs> right now. Unfortunately. Hmm. I'll say some have tried, but they just try to go to church, but not to be disciples. They have hmm. tried to go to church. I will use that word. But I have, there have been a lot of testimonials. I mean, um, they say it. Because one statement that was made when I was leaving my father's house was that, you are going to become a nile. Ah, Yoruba, maybe my Yoruba. Please permit someone, me. Someone on the ground. <laughs> yes. You will become a non-entity. And you will suffer so much. And you will mm -hmm. come back to beg us. I'll tell you what has happened has been the opposite. Mm. There has been nobody, all those who made those statements, they have been the ones on the other end, on the receiving end. And I have mm. never said no. Mm. So they are the ones coming to ask it's you for way. help. It's been the other way. So God reversed the statement. So, so in mm. fact, one of those who made that statement, it's, it happened that I got a double promotion to a commercial bank. When I got to that bank, he was, he's about almost several years older than me, and I was his senior. That's the best thing we made, one of those who made that statement. I became his senior while I was still in banking. So I had a very fast growing career. I was in uh, professional life. And, Praise uh, the Lord. I, I just think Our time, I wish you could just have more and more time, but we must stop at this point. We've gotten a question from menti.com. And to wrap up, to wrap up, just one uh, sentence we want to hear from the bishop. Gafcon, Gafcon, what have been your stand in the Anglican communion? We're looking at standing strong. We are looking at standing for the truth. What is Gafcon and what has been your stand there? We'll end on that note. Gafcon is a theological movement. So contrary to what the Western media are portraying Nigeria to look like, as though we are against homosexuality, no. The issue is not homosexuality. The issue is, did God create a man and a woman? Is God the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that there is in it? Now, if that fundamental three chapters of Genesis is not totally believed and accepted as authority, then there will be no revelation. That is the first one. Secondly, because of the creation that God created from Genesis, he commissioned humanity to a mission in the world. God is the first missionary. So if we reject the position of the Bible in Genesis, we will have no reason to do mission at all. 
then Jesus would have had no reason to come into the world to save the world. And we would have been of all people most to be pitied. Mm, right. There is going to be a, a, a resurrection and there is going to be a standing before God Almighty. And there is a heaven and there is a hell. So mm. GAFCON is a theological movement based on scripture. Mm. The mistake of the world is to think that because we have so advanced in science, we have now grown science to the point where we think, and it's only thinking, that we are now gods, which is the new norm now in the world, that people said they are now their own gods. I can do whatever li I like with my body. I can do whatever I like with my money and all of that. Gafcon is insisting, first and foremost, the authority of God's word. Secondly, the obedience to God's word. And consequently, the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ to the whole world. And the world need not perish because Jesus has already died in order that we might not perish. So there is a lot of hope in evangelism and we are on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ in Gafcon. And we're encouraging all the churches, everybody, uncompromisingly, because what Jesus did on the cross is irreversible. Our salvation is eternal. That we must pursue. And Jesus has saved. I'm a testimony. Jesus saved me. Amen. I'm a testimony also. Jesus saved me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are so grateful for our guests today. Uh, we thank God for how he has helped us. And we trust that uh, our young people listening to us will pick critical examples from these lives that have gone ahead of us. Uh, some of them are advanced. Some are still very young and much close to us. We are trusting that the Lord will indeed help us. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Our Father, we want to thank you for the little bit you've helped us to be able to glean from these lives that you have been molding and working on, and you are still working on. We are praying that, Lord, for every one of us listening, for the young people in every place across the world listening, it will be spurring something in our heart to seek you, to seek to know you. We see that you are very real. You are not a religion. No, it's not about some activity. You are very real and you can be very personal with us if we want to be personal with you. But we want to pray that you help us to find you and find you early in the name of Jesus. Thank you, blessed Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. <laughs>